water is at the core of the sustainability challenge and a global priority. Did you know that 44% of all disaster events around the world are flood related? and that over 700 million people are living today in areas where the maximum daily rainfall has shot up significantly. Now, these numbers were published in a report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2022. Barely a year earlier, cities in Germany and Belgium experienced, you may recall, devastating floods caused by up to 200 millimeters of rainfall in just a few days, claiming at least 200 lives and raking an estimated $43 billion in damages. Since then, cities in the Middle East, Ghana, Brazil, and Spain have all experienced similar incidents. The cruel irony is that some of the cities most exposed to flood threats are also at risk of droughts. Too much water or too little in the same location. So how do we cope with this? Do we need bigger drains, wider canals, more storage tanks? Or is it time for a new kind of infrastructure? Hi, I'm Nirmal Kishnani, a sustainable design strategist, author and educator based in Singapore. In this video, I'll explain what the concept of a sponge city is, how it works in dealing with extreme weather challenges and why it matters the world over. I'll show you examples of sponge cities that have been implemented with great success. And I'll share with you at the very end of this video why sponging your city or neighborhood could pay off nicely in years to come. This is more than just a question of water management, much more. This video is sponsored by the Holson Foundation for Sustainable Construction. More on them later. So what is a sponge city? Now, it's a relatively novel concept inspired by nature, wherein cities are designed to handle water, much like a sponge handles moisture. Essentially, they absorb, store, and slowly release rainwater, mimicking natural water cycles. The goal is to reduce flooding during extreme events or to shore up water supply for dry spells. So how does this work exactly? Well, this is done with a toolkit of urban elements and features. First, there must be space for water retention and storage. If it exists naturally in the city, we shouldn't tamper with it. Wetlands, for example, are a perfect example of nature's sponges. But if there aren't enough natural sponges around, then we need to introduce blue-green infrastructure that can do the job. Blue assets like rain gardens, bioswales, and retention ponds that can seamlessly be integrated with green spaces like parks. Green roofs and facades are also useful because they hold water and slow down runoff. Second, naturalize the city's water conveyance system wherever possible. Convert concrete drains and canals into streams and rivers. Why? Well, because the naturalization of waterways slows down and detains water and it increases ground absorption. Plus these elements can double up as public spaces and biodiversity habitats. So we get more bang for our buck. Third, we need to add on more permeable surfaces, lots more. The impermeability of roads, pavements, and buildings is a big part of the problem we face. It causes water to flow sideways on the surfaces, and when there is too much of water, the system backlogs. That's how floods happen. Permeable surfaces, say perforated pavers, allow rainwater, on the other hand, to infiltrate the ground vertically. Lastly, we must ensure rainwater capture and provide gray water treatment systems. Having on-site water supply in your building can make all the difference in the event of a drought. It can also reduce the compounded burden of all buildings on the municipal water system. When we look into sponge cities, water management is very often the primary driver. You want a way to flatten the curve between the two extremes, flood and drought. After adopting a sponge infrastructure in 2012, the city of Copenhagen in Denmark, for instance, has seen its flood-related damages decrease by 50%. In Wuhan, in China, green infrastructure has reduced flooding by over 20%. I'll tell you more about Copenhagen and the other cities in China a little later. But for now, let's talk cost, shall we? Is sponging expensive? Well, the answer very much depends on how you frame cost and return. The World Bank says that in the coming years, floods will cost cities globally an estimated $500 billion per year. And this number is expected to rise as climate change worsens. So the upfront cost of sponge infrastructure is actually less than what is spent on fixing the aftermath of a disaster. Cost is one thing, and I'll come back to it, but sponging offers many returns on investment. For starters, it improves water security. Sponge cities recharge the water table. 
In many places, groundwater is a primary source of fresh water, and the depletion of this resource invariably puts pressure on other water resources, which increases dependence on external supplies. Did you know that the draining of groundwater can cause a city to sink? That's what's happening in Bangkok and Jakarta. These mega cities are sinking mainly because of groundwater extraction. Now, depleting the water table is of course critical, but so is what happens above ground. Sponge features improve air quality, they reduce the urban heat island effect. A study in Guangzhou, China suggests that using porous concrete pavers could lower pavement surface temperatures by 12 degrees centigrade, while pervious brick could achieve a 20 degrees reduction. Elsewhere, cities with more green space have seen a reduction in air temperature by up to 5 degrees centigrade, which in a heat wave could be a matter of life and death. Urban greenery can also enhance day-to-day -day quality of life. Cities with more blue-green spaces are simply healthier and more desirable to live in. Singapore, for instance, which has positioned itself as a city in nature, has long used greenery to attract tourists to visit, to entice companies to set up base in the city-state. Greenery has also raised property values. In other words, urban greening is good for business. Other sponge elements, such as constructed wetlands and naturalized waterways, also support the formation of biological habitats. These ecological patches and corridors facilitate wildlife migration, nesting, and foraging. In short, sponge cities aren't just more resilient to extreme weather, they attract investment. They're more livable and lovable and more biodiverse. How can anyone say no to that? Well, China is one country that has said yes to sponge cities in a big way. I'll tell you more about China in a minute and specifically about the work of the pioneering landscape designer who first gave the concept its name. Before we get into that, let me quickly tell you about the world's most significant competition for sustainable design with a total prize pool of 1 million US dollars, the Holson Foundation Awards. Francis Carey, the acclaimed architect, won the Global Gold Award in 2012. Prior to winning, few had heard of him, and since, his profile has skyrocketed. At EcoGradia, we celebrate award winners like Carey. Last year, we spotlighted the 2023 winners in an exclusive webinar series. Who knows, this year, you might well be a part of this inspiring group of change makers. The portal for online submissions for the next cycle of the Holson Foundation Awards is now open, and it will stay open until February 2025, and it's free. Find out more in our show notes or at awards.holsonfoundation.org. The Sponge City Initiative is a pillar of China's urban planning strategy and was introduced by the government in 2013. Now, this initiative aims to transform cities into water-absorbing environments by incorporating green infrastructure into their urban fabric, such as permeable pavements, wetlands, green roofs, and water retention parks. The goal is to reduce flooding, improve water quality, and enhance overall urban resilience to extreme weather events. As of now, over 30 cities in China have implemented sponge city projects. The combined measures in these pilot projects have diminished flooding by over 20% so far and helped replenish groundwater. A prominent figure in the sponge city movement in China is Yu Kongjian, a well-known landscape architect who is a professor at Peking University and founder of Tourinscape, a leading design firm known globally for its focus on sustainable urban landscapes. Yu is credited with coining the term sponge city. His work over several decades has emphasized the integration of nature-based solutions into urban planning. Turinscape has shaped over a thousand projects in more than 250 cities, many of them showcasing the merits of Sponge City. As a result of this work, plus his personal advocacy with high-level politicians, Yu has been instrumental in shaping public policy in China. A prime example of Yu Kongjian's work is Yan Weizhou Park in Jinhua, Zixiang Province. Before its redevelopment, the site was an industrial wasteland. The surrounding urban areas were prone to flooding due to poor water management. Opened in May 2014, the park offers elevated pedestrian bridges and many recreational spaces. Half of the park is designed to act as a floodplain, taking in water during extreme events. The other half remains dry and is connected to the neighboring areas via bridges. During the monsoon of 2015, Yan Weizhou absorbed a surge of high river water, protecting the greater part of Jinhua from severe flooding. The park now attracts 40,000 visitors daily, 
an undeniable measure of its success as a public space. Further south, the perils of floods in Bangkok, Thailand, and Jakarta, Indonesia is compounded by a secondary issue. Both cities are sinking, and sinking fast, mainly due to the extraction of groundwater. Bangkok sinks by around two to three centimeters per year. Jakarta loses an average of one to 15 centimeters a year. In some areas, Jakarta is seeing up to 25 centimeters of subsidence annually. As coastal cities, both are also at risk from the rising sea. Almost half of Jakarta is already below sea level. Models predict that saltwater intrusion combined with subsidence will lead to potentially catastrophic outcomes for the city as a whole. To mitigate this problem, Jakarta is focusing on expanding its green infrastructure. Since 2022, the city has created 54 new parks and aims to further boost green space from 10 to 30% by 2030. One of them is the Tibet Eco Park, a sponge park completed in 2022, which was designed to renaturalize a 700 meter stretch of an existing waterway and turn it into a meandering river. Even though the park itself covers only 7.3 hectares, it manages a runoff from a much larger 367 hectare catchment area. Part of the park acts as a floodplain, helping to slow down water and recharge groundwater. Another aggravating factor for Jakarta's waterways is pollution. To counter this problem, Tibet Eco Park has riparian vegetation that filters and cleans the surrounding water runoff. The park is home to 1,500 trees, 400,000 shrubs, and 80 native plant species, which help improve water quality and foster biodiversity. As a result, the park has become a vital public space. Soon after its opening, it achieved a peak visitorship of 60,000 people on a single day. In Bangkok, Chulalongkorn University Centenary Park offers a similar solution. This 11-hectare park can store up to 3,500 cubic meters of water during heavy rainfall, helping to lessen flooding in the surrounding area. The park was created in the aftermath of the devastating mega floods of 2011. And since its completion in 2017, none of the nearby areas have experienced flooding. What's interesting about both these parks in Jakarta and in Bangkok is that they are retrofits of existing green spaces. Now, this is a surgical approach that aims to transform what already exists. It's a strategy carried out in other places too, such as Copenhagen, Denmark. Copenhagen has played a leading role in pushing flood resilience forward in the decade following a major cloudburst in 2011 that caused severe flooding and revealed just how vulnerable the city was. This event sparked the Cloudburst Management Plan, a broad initiative device to prepare the city for more frequent and intense rainstorms. The strategy here is to mesh natural infrastructure into the city's urban canvas to help manage excess rainwater and ease the burden on drainage systems. On a citywide scale, Copenhagen has backed the adoption of green roofs on buildings, permeable pavements on the streets, and rainwater gardens in public spaces to soak up the rain. At the neighborhood level, large green spaces serve as emergency reservoirs during heavy rainfalls. And within individual buildings, the integration of rainwater harvesting systems and green facades have helped manage water right where it falls. These layered strategies work together to prevent flooding and improve overall water management. A standout example of this integrated approach is the Sunkets Plus. This newly redesigned public square now acts as a floodwater reservoir during storms filled with bioswales and rain gardens to capture and absorb excess water. Close by, another area has been bolstered for flood mitigation by the integration of underground reservoirs and open channels. The landscape is now completely floodproof, and the environmental benefits are impressive. Green space has increased by 121%. The plants also absorb close to 4,000 kilograms of CO2 each year and help to reduce the urban heat island effect by 21%. The transformation has led to a 320% increase in public activity with more shops, cafes, and businesses opening up. The project highlights how climate adaptation strategies go hand in hand with urban livability. Sponge City is clearly a win-win proposition. I mentioned at the beginning that the decision to sponge any city or neighborhood, yours included, could prove profitable in the future. So here, let's circle back to the question of cost, since that's often a big sticking point. Several of the projects we've looked at today speak of hard and soft outcomes, but rarely do they attach dollar figures to these results. Here's one example that attempts to do this, the Bishan Amokyo Park in Singapore. The 62-hectare park, completed in 2012, focused on the naturalization of an old canal, turning it into a winding 2.7-kilometer river. 
the adjacent land was transformed into a water detention system with a rewilded public space. The upfront construction cost came in at 44 million US dollars or around $16,000 per meter run of the waterway. Opting for a brand new concrete canal instead, built in the traditional way, would have cost the city state 40% more. Soon after the park reopened, the number of visitors increased by several million per year. And almost half of those visitors engage in physical activities like jogging and cycling. Does this have an impact on public health? Well, it has been estimated in a study that the more active lifestyle at Bishan Amokyo Park is equivalent to a positive impact on health, whose dollar value is up to $31 million. The park's redesign also had positive effects on the neighborhood. Restaurants are thriving and residential apartment values have increased by 2 to 4%. This money goes directly into the pockets of citizens and businesses, but it also increases property and income tax returns that go to public coffers. Altogether, the financial gains from the park easily surpass the initial cost of its refurbishment. A similar case can be found in Portland in the US, where the city's investment in blue-green infrastructure transformed its urban stormwater management. Portland may have paid $8 million US dollars initially, but ended up saving around $250 million in hard infrastructure costs. And that doesn't even begin to factor additional benefits like cleaner air and groundwater recharge. Of course, numbers might vary for different cities, but the takeaway couldn't be clearer. Not only are sponge cities a sound proposition climate-wise, they also make economic, social, and ecological sense. If you think your city or any other close to where you live could leverage on the sponge city concept, do let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And speaking of water, if you'd like to hear more about Oceanics Busan, the world's first prototype of a resilient and sustainable floating community, check out this conversation with its designer, the Danish architect, Bjarke Ingels. I'm Nirmal Krishnani. Until we meet next, thank you so much for watching.